a negotiation include performance-based incentives in a contract because that's going to be the common process going forward. Hospitals are going to insist on hearing what pathologists are doing to save money, cut test utilization, and do any number of things. It's going to be important that we come up with the ingredients for how to develop performance-based incentives in a contract, and that's really going to be the focus of some of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, carving out the areas where value, which we keep talking about, in all kinds of national meetings where value pathologists can be demonstrated. And as the first step in the process, we like to suggest that the concept of party negotiation become part of the monthly practice activity and monthly practice dialogue. And in doing that, our first step is usually to establish time for the pathologists to get together, have a practice retreat, take a look at these new opportunities and new challenges that confronted the practice confronting part A, and really take a look and make this a significant focus. And then clearly, significant fact-finding. There's a lot of information out there to take advantage of, and we strongly urge everyone to do that. Uh, it's important to get started early and to get as much information as possible. So here's our timeline if you have a year to work with. Obviously, to the extent that there's less time available, the timeline has to be compressed. But the first step in the process that we're talking about starting we used October of 2015 by determining what the current thinking of in the institution. What's the CEO thinking? What's the CFO thinking? And also find out what's going on with other department heads. Who's been recently renegotiating a contract? Get information submitted to Medicare to get a copy of the hospital cost report, both for your hospital as well as for comparable hospitals in the area. Uh, subsequent to that, we want to conceptualize a department proposal that says, what do we want to try to accomplish? And in most cases, uh, practices have a tendency to limit their proposals to simply saying, how much do we want to see the Part A change? Obviously, the most pathologists are concerned the Part A is going to go down. Uh, ultimately, the concept is not simply talking about Part A, but talking about a whole range of issues that are going to confront the hospital and the pathology practice over the next two or three years. In addition, we'd like to see the practice do a two-week time study uh, about uh, 11 months into the process. And that two-week time study we're going to talk to you about in a minute in the month of April will be followed up by a second two-week time study. So as consultants to hospitals, we believe that a four-week time study done once a year provides a very credible level of documentation in terms of what the Part A activities are all about. To some extent, hospitals who say, let's have a week of time studies every single month are really getting involved with overkill and we're certainly not recommending that that kind of a process take place. On the other hand, the pathology practice who comes and says to me, gee, we haven't done a time study in three or four years, uh, and that's too much, is clearly out of line relative to the importance of regular documentation. Uh, in December, we suggest practice goals and objectives for the calendar year or the fiscal year, depending on what time frame we're talking about. And then in January to March, we're doing a data collection process, getting information on cost of living adjustments that are happening, making sure all the department statistics for 2015 are all properly put together, 
And then finally, in the month of April, we do a second two-week time study and document the first two weeks and the second two weeks and make sure that both of these things tie out. What we also like to do is meet with administration at least six months in advance for review of the contract renewal. That includes making sure that we're comfortable with what they're expecting in the process and also what we're expecting in the process. And sometimes there are a lot of surprises that take place because in many cases, uh, pathologists don't pay attention to contract renewal. Let's assume you have a typical three-year contract cycle until just before the contract comes up for renewal. So it's important six months in advance to discuss the contract renewal, to discuss the aspects of what's going to be included, and to have some sort of preparation for the process. So after that's taking place, we want to assemble a Part A fact book. We want to give the administration every A to Z piece of information they need to have in order to make a decision as to what's a fair Part A support to provide and how to incentivize the pathologists for doing things that are more creative activity. Uh, June, we want to present that proposal and fact book to administration, negotiations between July and September, getting that contract signed by the end of September, so we're ready to go for an October 1st starting date for the new contract. What's the current thinking? Well, first of all, it's extremely important to get the input from the CEO and the CFO of the institution and find out if they have a roadmap for the hospital's future, and if so, is there a portion of that roadmap that can be translated into what's important for the laboratory and how the laboratory can establish its own roadmap in consistent with, uh, that's consistent with the hospital's roadmap for the future of the institution. And I can tell you that in most cases, when people start talking about strategic thinking, years ago they were talking about a five-year plan. In today's environment, you're absolutely lucky to come up with a two- or three-year plan. And so we're very comfortable suggesting that a two- or three-year strategic plan is really the way to go. Has the hospital presented anything at a retreat or to the medical staff in terms of what their interests are in moving ahead? Has there been any testimony to state hospital associations? That's one way to get a sense of what's going on, but a face-to-face -face meeting is obviously the best way to proceed. What's been the experience of other department chiefs? Have they renegotiated any contracts recently? And the most important consideration is, has any performance incentive provisions been added to contracts that will give you a clue to what needs to be done in the new upcoming pathology arrangement? We think it's important to listen to what the hospital CFO was saying relative to Part A. And we had a hospital CFO write us uh, these points, which I just want to review very quickly in the context of simply saying, there's where they're coming from. They say to us at the beginning, anesthesia and radiology don't receive any Part A. Why should we be paying Part A to the pathologists? Uh, there's also some consideration that it's important to improve the relationships and to discuss the Part A activities at routine meetings with the administrator uh, who includes the line of service of the laboratory. We often find that, again, the dialogue that takes place is taking place at the last minute. It's not the kind of dialogue that's kind of in-depth that needs to be done, and it has to be a routine situation. So we suggest, and he, this person has suggested as well, that you have open and frank dialogue on billing and collection issues not just simply discussing complaints from patients, but discussing revenues and trends and analyzing where the money is coming from in the department, which physicians are sending in the activity, comparison to the prior periods. Again, the concept that this CFO had was, if we have routine meetings, there'll be no surprises when it comes time to renegotiate the contract. It's also important, and this person was talking about, a compliance and coding. It's certainly on the mind of every hospital administration, and specifically the compliance department, and they want to know what can be done to assure that in the laboratory the information is very, very tight, the coding is very tight, the controls on charges are very tight. So a suggestion was made to do joint audits between what the practice is doing, specifically as it relates to anatomic pathology, and what the hospital is doing for anatomic pathology, and then to make sure that the number of procedures in the clinical laboratory being effectively audited and reviewed for accuracy. Uh, the administrator in this particular case, the CFO, said to us, the practice has got to come to the table on ideas of how to grow the entire laboratory business. They aren't interested in hearing, we want to talk to you about how to improve the activities in anatomic pathology. They want to know that you've got some ideas in the clinical area and the rest of what's important to them. In terms of anatomic pathology versus clinical, in most hospitals, clinical laboratories represent 92 to 94% of the income of the institution, 
and the profit of the institution, with about 6% being left to anatomic pathology, cytology area. So it's a flip-flop situation between what pathologists are interested in and what the hospital administration is interested in. They also want to find out that you're available to do perhaps joint marketing calls with referring physicians and then how to address improved services. They want to see involvement with clinical equipment assessment and capital budget planning, and again, not waiting for the last minute to be very proactive with this. Hospitals being kept abreast of managed care negotiations and where the marketplace and pathology rates are. That is beyond important relative to the dialogue. Hospitals are constantly running into problems with their managed care negotiations. They want to know whether their hospital-based physicians are also having similar problems in negotiating with an Aetna or United Healthcare, et cetera. And they're looking for some dialogue back and forth so they can kind of work hand in hand with hospital-based pathology groups and other hospital-based physicians. And we found but more important, what the income that's being generated would be. And believe it or not, some of the people in finance actually do know how much money is coming into the laboratory in real cash money, not just simply disallowances. You have to also ask the question about what the nature of their third-party contracts are for anatomic pathology and clinical pathology. I've almost never seen a pathologist that I've talked to who has any idea of what the hospital is actually getting paid by individual third party, what Blue Cross is paying, what Oxford is paying, what United Healthcare is paying uh, for these services. Are they paying a percentage of charges? Are they paying a flat rate? Are they paying something to put into Medicare? It's really important to kind of have a sense of where the hospital is coming from. Do they have good contracts? Do they have bad contracts? I mean, clearly every pathology practice wants to know about their contracts for professional services. You should be just as interested in what the hospital is getting for their AP and their CP services. The other aspect of educating the pathologist is making sure that what you're billing professionally is also being billed technically. Uh, in most cases, it becomes a lifeblood situation for pathologists to make sure that everything that they do is being billed, but there's very little opportunity and interest in saying, by the way, how's the hospital doing on the technical side of things? So for every anatomic pathology procedure, for every 88305, there's obviously a technical portion of the 88305. And is the hospital 99% successful in building the same number of procedures that you're billing, and that becomes a very important part of dialogue to discuss with finance, how are we doing, how are you doing, can we make sure it's even better, can we make sure we have better charge controls. Also contacting the pathologists at local hospitals, and as a result of that, preparing a market study of what's going on. And in that market study, you want to know about competitive hospitals, how many full-time pathologists do they have? In that situation, What's the role of the PA and the PhDs in those hospitals? And who employs them? We have a situation where in many hospitals, uh, the PAs and PhDs are employed by, let's say, the PhDs by the hospital, the PAs by the practice. But in some places in the country, PAs may be almost dominantly employed by the hospitals. 
So to the extent that a PA is employed by the hospital, it makes a significant difference in determining how much Part A support the hospital is actually providing in the sense that are they providing the services of three full-time PAs? We'll estimate an average cost of 125000 per PA. So the hospital is really contributing $375,000 toward what they may consider to be Part A in addition to whatever they're paying the pathologists. So in comparing hospital to hospital, it's really important to know who these people are being paid for, not just strictly what the amount of money being paid to the pathologists are, but what other ancillary related costs the hospital is incurring. Uh, in the market study, you're also going to find out how many personnel are being supervised, the number of, and the type of personnel, how many gross, what the gross charges are for these other institutions, and the number of lab tests. One of the things that's important is the autopsy volume. And is this autopsy activity paid under Part A, or is it paid under a separate agreement? And these days, our recommendation to all pathology practices is they never receive payment for autopsies under Part A. We like to think of them being paid on a separate agreement per autopsy, and these days my baseline number is about $1,500 an autopsy. doesn't mean to say that a private autopsy is not worth $3,000, but to the extent that the hospital is paying for an autopsy, our baseline number is that $1,500 represents what a reasonable amount of money for the autopsy would be, not to say that $1,800 isn't a better number, but again, a baseline of $1,500 per autopsy. And again, separate from the Part A, so there's no misunderstanding about Part A time versus the time associated with the autopsy. And then, of course, finally, direct patient care accessions and tracking those things very carefully. So getting information from the State Hospital Association might be possible. Talking to a consultant with local expertise is also a possibility. And the one thing that I find very, very interesting and very important is to get extremely good benchmarking data. And in the context of that, I've been talking to a number of companies who do laboratory benchmarking. And I can tell you folks that the typical amount they want to charge is about $5,000 a year to give you benchmarking information. With good, tough negotiations, that price can be brought down to $2,500. If you get a company that gives you superb benchmarking information and you're only paying $2,500 for it, that is the most important aspect of being able to put the department in perspective with other hospitals, especially if the hospitals are being provided information that pertains to case complexity of the laboratory procedures and representative hospitals that the institution, the administration, feels very comfortable taking advantage of and saying, look, at these people are really our competitors. They're, we're very comfortable. We're seeing where we stack up with this competitive group. I often talk to hospital uh, pathology groups and to laboratory folks. They bring in consultants. They don't have good competitive benchmarking information. And as a result, they're not as credible as they might be with that kind of expertise being added. So one of the things that also is important to the pathologist is getting a submission of a freedom of information request to the Medicare intermediary for getting local cost reports. And in the local cost report is a schedule called AA2, which identifies exactly what every pathologist in that institution or other hospital-based physicians are being paid for their Part A services. So as an example of this, on page number 12, We've given you an actual submission, a form, that we used back in December of last year to submit to Noridian to receive a copy of uh, Part A uh, cost reports from a number of major hospitals in the Los Angeles area. And similar to this, you could simply submit a report request to any of the Medicare intermediaries in California. You have to be very specific about what hospitals you want, but they're very responsive to this process. And again, it will give you a far better idea of what's going on in the surrounding area, what's going on with the competitive hospitals, to be able to get this AA2 request submitted, these cost reports being submitted. So it's cr critical, it's available, and usually they'll respond to you within about 30 to 45 days. And again, with the right timing, the right startup timing on the process of negotiation, it's a great piece of information to have and to be able to determine how you stand with other hospitals. So we've provided you a copy, not a California hospital, of the actual cost report AA2 from Yale University Medical Center here in Connecticut and our home state, about five miles from where we're located. And if you read this thing across, even though it sounds incredibly boring, uh, Yale pays their pathologists $4 million for Part A services. They then say RCE, the reasonable compensation equivalent what Medicare says is reasonable, is 219000 per pathologist. They subsequently report in column number seven 
that the pathologist reported 31,800 hours of Part A time. In addition, there are adjustments to that Part A time for malpractice insurance, for the cost of memberships, et cetera. So at the end of the form, on line number 16, they ultimately say in this calculation that the calculation is $3.9 million is a fair amount of money to pay for Part A. As a result, the RCE disallowance, the reasonable compensation equivalent disallowance for this particular institution is $111,000. $111,000 is very, very small on a situation where the payments of Part A are $4 million. Now, obviously, there are very few hospitals other than major teaching hospitals in, in California that are paying $4 million for Part A and are probably recording only a disallowance of $111,000. But this will give you, again, an idea of what a actual uh, Medicare cost report, the AA2 schedule, looks like. And one of these is available for every institution that you request as part of the intermediary request. So getting that information, comparing hospital to hospital, taking a look at our do is go down, and we might as well leave it the exact same way it is. But ultimately, if there are inflation provisions that have been adjusted, they should be presented. What's been the history of testing volume? Have there been any programmatic expansion or contraction in the laboratory? What's the MD and laboratory staff changes since the last contract? Uh, do we have five full-time pathologists in the department, or is it now down to four? Have the laboratory staff been reduced from 610 people down to 550 people? They want to know exactly what the details are. And this particular fact book is the great way to put everything together and put it in one perspective. What is the employment of the PAs that I mentioned before? Is the hospital employing the PAs or is the practice employing the PAs? And how does that stack up with this institution compared to other institutions? Uh, cost of living adjustments. Here is an extract from Table 26 talking about cost of living adjustments. And you can clearly see that it's just not one single commodity. Are we dealing with the Medicare Care Index? Are we dealing with medical care services, just professional services? So it's really important in any kind of contracts when you talk about COLA adjustments to pinpoint specifically what index you want to talk about. I don't have any particular feeling for what index you want to use. I particularly like the overall medical care index number, again, 2% in 2013, 3% in 2014. I think that's probably a fair way to proceed. But again, lots of different terminology, and you want to find out what's acceptable at your particular institution uh, to look at for a COLA adjustment in the, in the payments. So continuing on with the concept of the fact book, the next thing you want to put in the fact book is good time study documentation. Now, again, I mentioned earlier that hospital administrations have a tendency to ask for maybe too much, or in some cases, pathologists provide too little. As a consultant to hospitals, I recommend that you put in four weeks of time studies, two studies, two weeks each, twice a year, that that tends to me, as far as I'm concerned, a very reasonable minimum expectation with a maximum expectation of two weeks per quarter. So if the hospital wants to see more than that, I'd say that they don't really have uh, much justification to do it. I'd say the four weeks twice a year is absolutely the way to go. What are the goals and objectives in this fact book of the laboratory the, of, and the laboratory and the pathology group? And how do these goals and objectives in the practice integrate with whatever the system's goals and objectives are. Again, a fact book like this, it's important to make those statements and make it clear as to what everybody is on the same page and we're doing the same thing. What has been accomplished in the past year, and the most important part of the accomplishments is the importance of quantifying the accomplishments. And again, everybody in hospital finance, in terms of CFOs, love to know about numbers. They're not interested in saying, well, we did this and we did that and better quality and this kind of thing. They want to know if you can quantify those accomplishments. And again, measuring those accomplishments in terms of the prior goals and objectives is quite important as well. So they wanted you to go back and say, what was previously provided? 
what's been accomplished, how are we going to go forward with that. And then the other thing that's kind of key is identifying department responsibilities by way of the organization chart and a matrix of responsibilities. All too often, uh, pathology practices are looked at as being, this is what the medical director does, and we're really not sure what the other pathologists in the practice do aside from uh, reading slides. So it's really important to recognize the distribution of functionality between everybody, all the pathologists in the group, and make sure the hospital is comfortable with that. Page number 17, we're providing you with an example of a time study format. And again, the concept would be this is not a four-line, a five-line allocation that's a generic form that the hospital is using. This is a customized time study specifically for pathology, and it's really important that you have a customized time study being done this way and make sure that the hospital understands and agrees to it in advance. It's not relevant to come up with what you consider to be an appropriate time study and then find that the hospital doesn't really believe in the categories or the way information is being presented. So we've got two-page time study here, and in addition to the time study, we suggest very strongly that there be supporting information, a diary, a copy of the Outlook calendar, a just a blank sheet of paper where you can write in specific comments and clarification for particular days of what was being done. Hey, we attended this particular committee meeting. We spent two hours preparing for it. We attended the committee meeting for an hour and a half. We had some download activity, further discussion with people. The more specific information can be provided, the happier the hospital administration is and the happier consultants like we are to believe in the credibility of the particular time study that's being presented. And what are some of the errors that we see when we look at time studies? Well, first of all, we're really appalled in many cases that the pathologist submitting time studies consider this to be a process that can be done in a very callous fashion. In many cases, people are submitting generic hospital forms. No, you've got to submit a customized form, customized to your particular institution and what you're doing for Part A. Tasks without explanation. Well, in many cases, people get a time study form and there's no description to indicate what you go in with particular categories. So when we come in and take a look and talk to individual pathologists about the completion of the time study, one person will put something in one category, another person will put exactly the same functionality in a different category because there was no real good explanation, no sit down with a practice meeting with written descriptions. Those written descriptions and directions have got to accompany the time study and everybody's going to be on the same page. So a little bit of advanced homework and making sure that the pathologists are comfortable with it goes a long way to making sure that the results are competitive and consistent. Failure to review the prior time studies. There's nothing worse than find out that one person was doing 30 hours a week worth of Part A and now this year they're doing 42 hours a week worth of Part A. What's the explanation? What's the difference? You've got to be able to explain the difference between the prior time studies and the current time studies. Another series of errors would be very simple mathematical mistakes. Uh, for some strange reason, I would say one out of five pathologists that submit time studies doesn't seem to be able to add up the numbers. And if all of a sudden at the end of the month, at the end of the column, you have 10 hours of the time, and yet the total is only adding up to 8.5 hours, obviously cross-footing looks pretty sloppy and, and provides some issue of credibility. Bad yet, added the group submission. Well, uh, people are told to submit their time studies, send them into the Department of Finance. Nobody in the practice is taking a look at these time studies or typically it should go through the chief or some sort of administrative coordinator. It's extremely important that be done because otherwise a lot of incorrect information, a lot of sloppy information is submitted. So we recommend that you designate one MD as a coordinator for the practice to make sure that all the time studies being submitted are being submitted the right way, they tie out, and they make some sense. Uh, at the end of the day, you can't work 16 hours if you came in at uh, 8 o'clock and you work till 5 o'clock. Uh, people sort of say, well, I did this and I did that, and I wasn't sure what category to put them in, so I put them into both categories. Again, it just makes the process look sloppy and does not uh, sort of give a sense of a comfort to the administration that we know what we're talking about. Another time would be people want to emphasize Part B. I'm not sure why, but ultimately you want to use weeks with full staffing so you don't wind up having a situation where you have less than full staffing and you're basically focusing on the Part B activity as the priority. And then the other consideration is short days. Uh, Doc said to me, look, at, we left at uh, 2 o'clock because I had to take my son to some sort of practice. They submitted that as being their day. Nonsense. You've got to forget about that day and submit another day where you worked a complete work week. You can't simply say, let me 
put short days in here, maybe take vacation days, et cetera. You've got to submit complete information over the time study period because every single hour you're not submitting gets multiplied, extrapolated, and comes up with bad results overall for the Part A. Some more errors. Inaccurate start-stop time. Again, that concept of when did I start, when did I stop, how many times did I take for lunch, uh, and making sure that it makes some sense. Uh, the worst experience we ever had was a client of ours that submitted time studies and told us that they were working till 5 o'clock. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, physician's parking lot was right outside of the administrative office space, and uh, they had the secretary there saying, hey, what time did Dr. X leave? And Dr. X one day left at 3.30, and the other day left at 4 o'clock, and whatever, and nothing tied out to the fact that they said they worked till 5 o'clock. So it's really important to make sure that nobody gets caught uh, inappropriately with regard to how they present their information on the time studies, and the hours are absolutely accurate, and the work is being looked at as being a serious situation. Filling it out at week's end? No, you've got to fill it out every single day before you depart. Uh, One of the things that we thought would be helpful is, even if it becomes something you want to plagiarize, is what are the goals and objectives of a particular group? They don't have to be that customized, but they have to at least be put down and be clear that they have goals and objectives. In this particular case, some of the things that they've had, point number B, they were exploring regional arrangements with other pathology groups, hospitals, and commercial laboratories. They were enhancing surgical pathology reports to make them easier to read. They were working with the hospital to improve the current website and addressing the skills of pathologists and benefits of using the hospital laboratory. It was setting up protocols to make sure that all the CPT codes were billed and be paid for. So identifying even something as general as some of these goals and objectives, and this happens to be some of the goals and objectives of a particular practice, uh, is still looked at and respected as opposed to a submission of time study information and documentation without a series of goals and objectives. Again, a little bit more goals and objectives. Test utilization is every, in everybody's mind. And again, the most important thing in number G is reducing the number of unnecessary tests. Boy, that's uh, the big paradigm these days as to what everybody wants to do. Uh, getting patient satisfaction and physician satisfaction surveys improved. Is there a press gainy survey for the people in the, in, the, in the hospital, the patients? But what about satisfaction of the referring physicians or the nursing staff, et cetera? Getting good uh, scale reports of satisfaction surveys are kind of important. And again, one of the things that's also important is participate in the negotiation with vendors. Increase the involvement of the practice in negotiations early on in the process. Again, that was a mention that was made by the CFO uh, in the presentation I made a few minutes ago. So the key thing is to get involved and to make sure that their goals and objectives are stated. To the extent you can take these goals and objectives and quantify them, they're much more respectable. They probably mean twice as much as opposed to making a general statement. But then at the end of the year, comparing these goals and objectives with the actual experience and what's been accomplished. Uh, I, some, I said a few minutes ago the importance of developing a matrix of responsibilities. In many cases, having something as simple as this makes a far better presentation than a long-winded presentation that goes on at very, very small spacing at eight-pitch font uh, to be able to say, look at this is what every one of our pathologists are doing. So if we have a five-person group and one person is the chief, what's the chief doing? And assuming that chief is the medical director, and what's pathologist A, B, C, and D doing in each aspect of the department? And trying to be as, as concrete as possible on page number 24 and 25 relative to the matrix of responsibilities in the department. Just gives an idea of how to present this thing other than simply in a long-winded verbiage way just a little bit more interesting and more easy for the hospital administration to understand. So the next item in the fact book was committees. What kind of committees are you assisting on? Are you the member of the committee or are you the chairman of the committee? What's the meeting schedule? List of the committees by pathologists. That has got to be in the fact book. It's probably one of the most significant roles and monies that should be paid out to the pathology practice for Part A. And having that very precisely defined is a key ingredient to be able to get comfort with the administration on paying. 
than the Part A services. Well, you know, you can make long lists. There's lots of lists available from the Medicare program. What's the role of medical director? Very sing-song, if you will. If you can take that list and make it easy to read and customize for the institution, it will be far more acceptable than if you simply pull out reams of information that says, this is what a medical director does, this is what's required by the Medicare codes, et cetera. So making it customized and making it easy to read is important in that process. Department annual report should be in the fact book. What kind of volumes are we talking about before? What about the turnaround time? Again, I mentioned before the benchmarking. Anything you put in from benchmarking information would be fantastic relative to comparing against what the norm is. What are the uh, scores in the press gainy for the department? Again, the patient satisfaction, MD, RN surveys. And then the concept of comparative data that you've gotten from the Medicare cost reports, the AA2 schedules. Do you come up with any information from your discussion of other folks in the area? What are the average hours worked for the chief? What are the average hours worked for the associates? One of the things that I found was incredibly naive on the part of a consulting firm, supposedly a consulting firm with a national reputation, is they came up with a concept recently to one of our clients and said, every pathologist provides a reasonable amount of Part A, and that provi provide Part A is 25% of their time. So they didn't say that the chief was doing 47% and somebody else is doing 15%. They just simply said, we've studied the marketplace, and we know the pathologists are all doing 25% Part A. Uh, if that helps you, that's something to think about. But as far as we're concerned, it's a very hurtful situation, especially if good time studies are being provided. The other ultimate consideration is, what's the fair market value for the time that's being provided? We find that consultants in the industry have recently told us that they believe that pathologists providing Part A should be paid at $150 an hour. On the converse of that, we find out that with regard to the Medicare program, they recently republished the RCE number, which is what everybody's standard is in the consulting business, what the reasonable compensation equivalent is, and they ultimately say that the pathologist should be paid $260,300. $260,300, the new number that CMS has come up with, is basically $125 an hour. The good news is there's a couple of things to add on to that, and we're going to further talk about the benefits of being in California, where the wage index is considerably better than other places in the country. So in addition to the fixed RCE, and this is information that Doug Catman provided from the college, uh, you can provide, you can add malpractice insurance, you can add a CME to that, and I would mention to you that our experience across the board is that a CME adjustment of $5,000 per pathologist is commonly accepted by about 95% of the hospitals we deal with. You can also add the cost of memberships, $1,500, $2,000, whatever seems reasonable, and these things can all be added to the published RCE number to come up with what a pathologist is worth. Uh, the good news for the folks in California is uh, you have a wage adjustment in the uh, reimbursement that comes by way of the APC reimbursement, the so-called outpatient reimbursement, that's considerably better than everybody else in the country. So what we did was we took the various areas in California and arrayed them from the top to the low. So if you're in San Francisco, your wage adjustment is 67% uh, better than the national number. Obviously, Santa Cruz getting 72%, but for most of California, it's about 1.3, especially Los Angeles area, Fresno, et cetera, 1.3 times 1.2881 uh, times what the national number looks like. So if the consideration is to say, here's where we are, here's what's going on with the wage index in our area, ultimately, we are not the norm, we are not the average. So if you take a look at the RCE, the RCE is supposed to represent what the average payment for pathologists is anywhere in the country. However, you can say, look, we're not the average. Our reimbursements are considerably different. Our payments are different. As a result, for example, we're in, um, uh, let's say, Modesto, California. We need to have an adjustment of 28.91% uh, over the national number because we are that much different from the national number. And this is what the Medicare program is using for the reimbursement for the RCE program, uh, for the, excuse me, for the uh, APC program. The only consideration for this is that when they do this calculation, they use 40% of the calculation from a national number, and they'll use 60% of the calculation that'll be customized to the local number. So it'll be very interesting when you add the two things together and use that for purposes of discussion with the hospital administration as to what constitutes a reasonable amount per hour. I would still tell you that I'm very comfortable thinking of $150 
as being what a pathologist is worth for providing Part A services, not providing clinical services, providing Part A services to the institution. So now you come up with a proposal to the administration and say, look at here is the amount of money for an RCE, here's an adjustment because now we're talking about coming up with a color adjustment for 2016, C numbers of 2015 number, we're adding CME to this, we're adding malpractice insurance, we're adding cost of memberships. Now we're saying that the pathologist is worth 278, the average number of hours a year, 2080 is part of the factor. Now a pathologist is worth $134 using this Medicare formula. But again, that's the number that's a national number that's still to be adjusted by the California experience. And again, the good news is there's good information to rely on the California experience bringing you up certainly to that 150 or even more. So in this case, in this particular practice, they said we did 3,077 hours of Part A, and therefore our Part A should be $412,000. Now they come up with a proposal. So starting with $412,000 worth of documents, we're talking about here could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, clearly. So in this particular case, if you started off by saying our time justifies 412000 and you further say let's take off an adjustment for the PCCP billing, you come up with net Part A support of 350. In this particular example, the current Part A support the practice is getting is 275000 so there's a variance of $75,000. Our proposal in this particular situation says to the hospital, you pay us an adjustment, take that two seventy-five. dollars and bring it up to $300,000, but in addition, give us an opportunity to earn an extra $100,000 based upon performance incentives that would be based upon either a percentage of the savings or some fixed dollars for doing certain things for the institution. What about negotiating tactics to be able to get these things accomplished? The key thing is never sit down with administration when you talk about Part A and limit it to just Part A. It's got to be talking about other aspects of the term and termination of the contract, the adequate number of MDs. Do we, does the hospital contract require 3.5 pathologists? Uh, your requirement to participate with payers and the criteria for participating with payers and the concept of usual and customary fees. There's got to be at least eight or ten aspects of what you want to talk about. So there's a lot of give and take in the discussion back and forth with regard to getting the right Part A support. Objective criteria, local marketplace. Again, competitive hospitals are very important to take a look at. Consider the possibility also of joint venture opportunities to improve revenue and reduce cost. And again, what can you accomplish if you have multipliers of existing volume? One of the things we did in Connecticut some years ago was we established a freestanding cytology laboratory. And that cytology laboratory included ownership by six competing hospitals and by five different pathology groups. We did 150,000 pap smears a year. It was a very successful operation for about 20 years before there were changes that were made that you no longer considered to be appropriate. But it became a very, very positive opportunity for pathologists to work with each other, to dialogue both in terms of individual pathology practices and competitive hospitals that felt that they were making an improvement by way of having regional operations here. So if you want to talk about performance-based incentives, and I'll go through this quickly, how do you proceed with that? Well, first of all, You've got to get your options in line with hospital priorities. It's not important for the pathologist to say, we'd like to be able to do this, if that's not one of the hospital priorities. You've got to also have incentives that provide an opportunity for an ongoing dialogue, which means you have to modify your goals every single year. You typically, again, before have three-year contracts. Every single year you have to come down and sit down with administration and talk about the goals and objectives relative to incentive arrangements assigning a value to each one of those components that's either a fixed amount or percentage of the savings, and detailing a baseline and criteria for the change. If incentives are going to be more difficult in the future, and they are going to be, the bar is going to continue to be raised. I spoke to an academic chairman 
number of years ago at a meeting, and he said to me, well, I don't want to put incentives in place because every year they're going to be increased. Absolutely. Every single year they're going to be increased and modified, and that's the way life goes. It's not a matter of staying flat and that you continue to rest on your laurels. Educate and document the cost savings. You're going to talk about voice recognition, template reporting. Again, we talked before about the reconciliation of charges, state-of-the-art reporting technologies, outsourcing opportunities, and marketing and sales costs, participating in some of those things. These are some of the things to include in terms of negotiations. And then for the next few pages, we have some information on what kind of performance-based items could be included in the contract. The most traditional situation for five years ago, 10 years ago, has been the turnaround time of surgical pathology, basic specimens versus major uh, surgical recessions, and autopsies and frozen sections. That has been something that we've seen over the years that have been included in a lot of contracts with incentives being added to those things. These days we're seeing less and less of that as hospitals are saying, what's the high standard, what do we expect to get, and we're not going to sit there and put up with anything less. Uh, we've got to reduce unnecessary test utilization. Everybody wants to do that. Improving satisfaction, again, the press gainies or any other kind of other studies that are being done to be considered. What's our role in terms of management? What can we do to improve the management situation? Again, I talked about in the middle of this page, goals and objectives. Uh, in terms of talking about mentoring new laboratory administrators, that's a really important thing when a new laboratory administrator comes on board. How much time do you spend with that person and how much effort do you spend to make sure that they're up to speed as quickly as possible? And developing outreach programs, things like this. Some more management activities, reconciling the PC and the TC reimbursements. Get a CAP certificate for medical directorship. Uh, in many cases, I've been able to come up with a $5,000 kicker for the pathologist if they get that CAP certificate for medical directorship. And again, the proposing regional initiatives is another way to proceed. Some of the marketing and sales activity would be coming up on the marketing plan. $5,000, $10,000 to develop a marketing plan and make sure that the hospital administration signs off on it as an effective way to proceed. Integrating websites for the hospital and the practice. If the practice website is pretty strong, it should be integrated with the department website, the hospital, and making sure that all the collateral works back and forth. Participating in sales calls with hospital representatives. Again, the more you can do with things like that and the more the hospital feels you're a partner with them, the better off the practice is going to be. Um, and ultimately, for example, send out testing, negotiating every single send out testing arrangement every single year. And of course, everybody's talking these days about blood management program, blood utilization costs. We recently were involved with a hospital of four pathologists. They were able to save $300,000 a year in their blood products by going to a different vendor. And obviously, that looked out looked to be spectacular savings from the hospital administration point of view. They were very, very delighted about it. And to the extent that the pathologists included a performance incentive in it, they were able to participate in the cost savings there. Compliance, laboratory compliance plan needs to be updated, integrating with a practice plan. Uh, and then finally, things like molecular testing. One of the things that I'll talk about there just quickly is to say we've recently seen a situation where uh, every single test that's ordered over $500 in value requires a pathologist's approval. And that has led to a significant reduction of the testing cost and a much better understanding of what's being ordered by simply having that criteria included in the contract. Here's some actual performance incentives. You can take a look at these at a subsequent time. But these are real live numbers, what people have received for doing certain things that I've talked about in terms of some of the concepts and putting in perspective. Now, you know, none of these numbers look like $350,000, $500,000. They're $5,000 here, $10,000 there. In a typical four-person practice of pathology, we're seeing performance incentives that are somewhere between $50,000 and $75,000. For a larger practice, obviously, they can be considerable. And for major academic institutions, they can be millions of dollars. But every little bit helps. And this is an evolving concept. It's just something that is getting off the ground. And we think it's going to be more and more acceptable as time proceeds. Again, some of the more significant things, the contribution margin, getting a savings of the hospital operating budget, uh, being able to pick up a share of income that's generated from preventing outpatient tests from leaving the system. All these things are real live examples of what people have been able to accomplish in performance-based incentives. And then ultimately, what are the next steps? What do you have to do? Uh, get the educational process started as soon as possible. As soon as the contract is signed, don't sit back and wait for the next contract cycle. It's got to be an ongoing creative dialogue between 
the pathologist in the hospital, they've got to think of you as their entrepreneurial partner. They're not going to think of you as simply a line item on the budget that they simply pay $600,000 a year to. And boy, that number is so easy to chop because 600000 could be something else. They bring in a consultant. The consultant comes to them and says, I can save you money. And the money they save is to say, let's just pay them half of what we used to pay. In fact, in many cases, I can tell you that a lot of consultants coming in from the outside use the death and taxes scenario. In the death and taxes scenario, let's take the practice of being paid $600,000 a year. Uh, the automatic situation is we're going to pay you nothing. And then by the time this negotiation goes back and forth and back and forth, the new number is $300,000 a year. That's the tax scenario after you've heard the death scenario. And so it's much more difficult to recover from that than it would be if you go into this thing proactively, you make the case, you've got all the information available, you submit your time studies, you have good discussions with the hospital administration, and you make sure they cover the appropriate amount of time. So that's basically my uh, presentation as it relates to how to prepare for a Part A negotiation. That was excellent. A very, you know, detailed analysis of, uh, you know, what what we need to do in order to justify the the party compensation. It was very thorough. So, go ahead and open it up to questions. If we can open the phone lines, if anybody has any questions. Okay. I don't think well, I have any a couple questions. that. Okay, uh, I have a couple that that uh, came to mind as as I listened to the presentation. So, um, I mean, as you said, in an environment where you know hospitals are always looking to reduce cost, um, you you think it's realistic to assume that there are ways to get hospitals to recognize the the value of incentives and part A or, and part A payments. I tell you that in my role of a hospital consultant, they are anxious and looking forward to hearing from pathologists about creative solutions. And uh, I can tell you that they're not anxious to lay out the big bucks, but if they feel that they'll be given a decent opportunity to see some improvements, they want to incentivize people to do that. They certainly incentivize folks in administration to get the job done, to improve things, and they're more than willing to do the same thing with pathologists, but they have to know the pathologists, on the other hand, are capable of making things happen and being very proactive. And I know when the initial uh, RCE uh, element was established by, by Medicare years ago, and there was, that, as you said, a, s a very simple form that you simply indicate the hours and, and basically the uh, uh, FD equivalents um, and suggest you do a time study. But if people are doing that simple format, I assume the, the task is that much more difficult. Oh, yeah. The information has got to be very precise and much more detailed. Uh, everybody is looking for documentation. Uh, to the extent we recently worked with a client in putting together one of these fact books, and then the hospital hired their own nationally recognized consultant to come in, the first thing the person said was, you know, he said, I don't believe in all the numbers that you presented to me, but you've done an excellent job of documenting the process, and it's going to be very difficult for me to counteract a lot of things you're talking about. I would say that we got hit with about a 5%, 6% reduction factor, uh, but we had, a, we had our act together, we had our documentation together, and it was a very well-respected process. But if you simply do this very, very simple time study every so infrequently, if you just sort of take the attitude of saying the administration should know what we're doing, believe me, the answer is the administration doesn't know what you're doing and needs uh, good uh, education. 
and then one last question, um, getting the comparative data from Medicare on what, you know, uh, maybe competing hospitals or regional hospitals are, are doing in terms of party compensation, how long, it take, how long does it take to get that kind of information back from, uh, from Medicare after you request it? Somewhere between 30 and 45 days. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Um, unless there's any last questions from the audience, I will thank uh, the participants for joining us today and thank Bob for doing uh, an exceptional job. And